Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, as a quick note, in addition to there being a recording going on, uh, there are members of the press who are at the event as well who will be taking pictures. Um, so nice to see everybody. Um, please welcome me, uh, well, go with me with, in welcoming uh, Chair Lena Khan. Uh, she is the chair of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, she graduated from Yale Law School in 2017, where she wrote a paper about antitrust called Amazon's Antitrust Paradox, uh, which made big waves in the antitrust community. She was appointed to the Federal Trade Commission in 2021 and has served as the chair since then, and we are very excited to speak with you. Great, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I should also probably introduce myself just so other people. My name's Helena Lee, I'm a 2L here. Um, I interned at the Federal Trade Commission Northeast Regional Office um, last summer, and I'm a big antitrust fan, as I imagine a lot of the other people in the room are. Um, so just to start, um, I mentioned that you wrote Amazon's Antitrust Paradox while you were a law student at Yale. And I was wondering what inspired you to write that paper, and if you have any fond memories or regrets from the experience. <laughs> <laughs> so I got interested in antitrust through a bit of a quirky way, which was that after undergrad, I was working as a business journalist and economic researcher for a think tank. And my area of research was consolidation in market structures. And I was basically given assignments to do deep dives into various sectors of the US economy and try to understand how had the market structure changed in recent decades. Um, one of the, and I did you know, deep dives into uh, agriculture markets, airlines, book publishing, uh, various commodity markets. Um, and it really gave me just a tour through whole parts of our economy. And it was clear that there had been consolidation uh, pretty much across the board. And interestingly, that consolidation had economic effects, um, sometimes economic effects that the various models and theories did not predict. Um, but also importantly, it had political effects. And so for example, when I was researching um, chicken farming, uh, it was clear that these chicken farmers who were entirely dependent sometimes on just a single company for their livelihood, it was clear that that deep imbalance of power was resulting in practices that sometimes really undermined their basic liberties. So for example, um, there was a point at which the Obama administration was doing all of these workshops trying to understand competition and agriculture issues. They invited chicken farmers to come talk to them. And a whole bunch of chicken farmers were too scared to go um, because the chicken processing companies had told them, if you speak up, we're going to retaliate against you, uh, which could have been devastating to their livelihoods. And so it was just a really sharp illustration of the ways in which concentrated economic power can also undermine core liberties, including freedom of speech. And oftentimes, you know, especially in law schools, you know, we're conditioned to think about government infringements on those types of liberties and less conditioned to think about the ways in which concentrated private power can also undermine those freedoms. One really interesting thing about the antitrust and anti-monopoly laws is that they were precisely crafted with that prism in mind. And so there was a recognition that in the same way that our constitution creates checks and balances in our government sphere to safeguard again against concentrations of public power, that we needed antitrust and anti-monopoly to similarly create checks and balances in our commercial and economic sphere to similarly safeguard against those concentrations of power. Um, so broadly, that's what got me interested in the history of antitrust. Um, and shortly before I went to law school, one of the last areas where I was doing research was e-commerce. And I was doing that research through basically calling up uh, two sets of actors. Um, one was investors and Wall Street analysts that were viewing Amazon through the prism of just investment. Um, and the other was merchants and businesses that had come to rely on Amazon to access markets. And it was just a really striking set of conversations because to both so those sets of players, the kind of structural power that Amazon was assuming was very obvious, right? Investors kind of kept saying, this is buy, buy, buy. Like, yes, the financials might not be you know, showing uh, a lot of promise at this moment, but believe us, structurally, this company is positioning itself to earn huge returns in the future. Um, similarly, merchants and, and firms were 
recognizing that their pathways to commerce and to accessing consumers in the digital age was increasingly becoming mediated by this one company. And it was just a really crisp example of how the dominant antitrust prism at that moment, uh, which was you know, primarily looking at consumer prices, how that could be a short-term prism that overlooked structural power that firms were amassing. Um, and so that's really what led me to write the article that was using the company as a way to tell a broader story about changes that we've seen in antitrust interpretation. That's a really, I mean, personally, I've read the paper. I thought it was really actually easy to read for how complex the topic was. And so I really appreciated the way that you broke it down and brought antitrust into the modern age from the same issues that were happening in the 1914s or 1920s when the FTC was first created. Um, so moving on a little bit, um, recently there's been a trend among courts to limit uh, the agency's enforcement powers. We saw in the AMG decision with the Supreme Court that they limited the FTC's ability to pursue monetary remedies um, under the FTC Act. And I was wondering um, how you think through the role of the courts um, and their potential pushback on agency enforcement as you're setting a path for the FTC's enforcement. Yeah, so the AMG decision was super consequential because it basically said the main statutory provision of the FTC Act, uh, Section 13B, which the agency had used to get back money, both redress as well as disgorgement, um, the court said that was no longer available uh, for the FTC. In practice, that means that for antitrust cases, there are very few, if not no, real pathways to getting money back um, in antitrust cases. In our consumer protection cases, there are some other statutory provisions that we can use. So Section 19 of the FTC Act, uh, we can also, through rulemaking on the consumer protection side, uh, once if we codify a practice as a law violation under a rule, we can then get both redress as well as civil penalties. So we've really been pivoting and doing a lot more rulemaking for that reason. Um, you know, we're a law enforcement agency, and be it through adjudication or ultimately um, rulemaking, uh, our actions can be challenged in the courts. And so obviously we you know, respect the precedent. One thing that I've been very focused on at the FTC is making sure that we are fully exercising all of the statutory provisions that Congress has given us. Um, I think there's been you know, a trend at various points over the last few decades to focus just on some provisions and not other provisions. So even the reliance on 13B of the FTC Act meant that the agency wasn't activating some of the other provisions as much, be it Section 19 or be it rulemaking. Um, we've also been taking a fresh look at some of these authorities and making sure that we are interpreting them and applying them in ways that fully consistent with what Congress wrote in the statute um, and with the prevailing legal precedent. So one example here is our approach to our unfair methods of competition authority. So unfair methods of competition are prescribed in the FTC Act in Section 5. Uh, this is in some ways the heart of the FTC's competition mission. And the reason Congress prohibited unfair methods of competition is because it believed that the Sherman Act and even the Clayton Act didn't go far enough. And so it wanted the FTC to serve as an expert agency that was allowed to go beyond the four corners of the other antitrust statutes. Um, and this was an authority that the FTC used quite often you know, through the 70s, at least into the early 80s. Um, there were some setbacks in the courts in the early 80s where uh, the FTC's effort to use this standalone Section 5 authority got some pushback in the courts. If you look closely at those decisions, those were not repudiations of the FTC's Section 5 authority. It was really about how the FTC was applying it to particular facts. Of course, we're saying you didn't have enough evidence. Um, but that experience, that pushback from the courts, led the FTC to retreat from Section 5 entirely. And so over the last few decades, there had basically been um, no real effort to exercise Section 5 in ways that created any type of distinction from the Sherman Act or Clayton Act, which in practice I view as you know, a real dereliction of, of duty in a fundamental way. Right? Congress created the FTC, it passed the FTC Act to ensure the agency could do things that were different from just what the Sherman Act and Clayton Act um, prohibited, but yet here we were not really exercising that part of our mandate. So last year we issued a policy statement um, that reflects you know, deep research into looking at every litigated Section 5 decision to try to figure out, okay, here's the text of our statute. It's 
clearly means something. It clearly means something that's different from the Sherman Act and Clayton Act. Let's try to give meaning to it. Um, and so that policy statement is really important for us, and it's one that we've been following on uh, through enforcement actions and rulemaking. Thank you. Yeah, so it sounds like the FTC is taking a look at the other like historical purposes of these statutes and grounding them in the facts of the case that are happening today. That's right. And in addition to the FTC Act, um, there have been a whole bunch of instances in which Congress has actually given the agency additional statutory authority. Um, so one example is uh, back in the 90s, Congress gave the FTC the ability to do rulemaking to go after made in USA fraud. So this is when you know, products are made somewhere else, but companies just slap made in USA labels on it. Um, that's something that Congress allowed us to go after, but we really hadn't codified that as a rule. Um, so early in my tenure, we were able to finalize that rule. And now, especially at a moment where the administration is looking to reshore and incentivize production in the US, we're actually able to ensure that companies can't lie about it. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Speaking about antitrust, like on the ground a little bit more, um, something I've experienced as someone who's very interested in antitrust is um, that there can be a bit of a diversity problem in the antitrust bar in particular. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what role you think diversity plays in the legal profession generally, but also in antitrust in particular, which touches so many different areas of the law and also our lives. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And you know, there's no doubt that um, the antitrust profession doesn't represent the full diversity of our country, and I think that's increasingly recognized. And um, you know, I think we all have an obligation in the profession to try to address that and make sure it's a more kind of hospitable place for everybody. I think more generally, though, um, we'd also seen a effort to make antitrust much more technocratic and arcane. And so, uh, you know, when I was in law school. Mostly the people taking antitrust were people who wanted to go do M&A after law school, oh, rather than people who wanted to say go into government, you know, working for the FTC DOJ or working for state AGs. And I think that was part of a broader trend where um, certain areas of the law, what you might call kind of public law areas, were viewed as clear sites for public service and public interest. But areas of the law that govern corporate power and govern businesses were not as readily seen as sites for public service. I think that started to change a bit after the financial crisis, uh, where there was a recognition that you know, there were all these laws uh, that should have been governing financial practices that were totally unenforced, and it had catastrophic consequences for our economy and our country. Um, but I think that's really started to change. I think uh, over the last you know, few years, there's been a much clearer recognition of the ways in which the decisions that antitrust enforcers and competition policy regulators are making, that that has huge effects on people's day-to-day -day lives, right? It can affect how much people's essential medicines cost. It can affect how much people's groceries cost. It can affect how much um, you know, privacy there is in a market. It can affect how much innovation there is. It can affect whether markets are resilient or whether they're highly fragile. Uh, it can affect you know, how much concentration of power we see in our economy and how that can corrupt democracy. So I think there are all of these different facets of competition, and as more and more of those are being recognized, I think there's a broader set of people that are becoming interested in these questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll just ask one final question, and then we'll open it up to the audience for Q&A. Um, if you have a question uh, for Chair Khan, you can go to the mics on either side, they should be live. Um, but I'll ask the last question. If folks don't have questions, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> so I'm happy to keep going um, either way. Uh, but just to close up, uh, just this last part, um, often in law school, it feels like we're making decisions that have this big lasting impact on your career, and you don't know what those impacts are going to be. And so it feels really scary to make those decisions in the moment. Um, and I know that you've had a bunch of those moments in your career, like you chose to go work at Columbia Law School instead of clerking on the Ninth Circuit. And I imagine that was kind of a big decision to make, um, especially because clerking can feel like something that you're meant to do after attending law school. Um, and I was just wondering how you think through those kinds of decisions and if you have any advice for law students who are making those same kinds of decisions now. Yeah, it's a good question. And I mean, uh, you know, uh, I ended up not clerking, not out of choice necessarily, but because my judge ended up passing away uh, a few months before I was supposed to clerk. And you know, that's one of those moments that can feel like all of these plans you have put in place got totally scrambled. Um, and it was actually 
that falling through that led me to go work at the FTC um, initially, where I ended up uh, working for Rohit Chopra, who was a commissioner at the time, who now heads up the CFPB. Um, and so I would say just generally, it's, it's difficult to be kind of over-determinate about things. I think, you know, things, opportunities can open up in unusual ways. Um, I would say in law school, I also, uh, you know, took antitrust, but really tried to take a whole set of classes that um, more generally accounted for the shape of corporate power. Um, I also ended up doing a clinic that I was very involved in, so I was part of the a mortgage foreclosure defense litigation clinic where we were representing homeowners that were being foreclosed upon by the big banks. Um, and that was a really interesting uh, experience because uh, it showed at that time how a lot of the banks reserved their least sophisticated counsel to engage in that type of litigation. And so as law students, we were actually able to do a lot um, and I think just showcase just a lot of sloppiness that can be in the system where companies are able to get away with it because they assume that their people that they're up against are not going to have, um, you know, legal representation. Um, so I would say just more generally, uh, you know, being open minded uh, about opportunities that can come up. Um, I think at this moment, you know, we're just at a historic inflection point in antitrust and competition policy. Um, but really more generally between the relationship between government and our markets. Um, you know, across the administration, we're seeing a whole bunch of assumptions being rethought and revisited. So be it around, you know, the administration's actions um, on industrial policy and kind of reasserting the role of government there, uh, the executive order on competition, which implicates the FTC and antitrust division, but also agencies across the board that are being invited to reactivate their competition tools. Um, and so I think it's a particularly exciting and important moment for government service, um, be it at the federal or state level. Yeah, and just a quick plug that the FTC recently announced its first honors program, um, which I don't know if you would want to expand on more, but you can find a lot more information on the website too. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting program. We're really happy to be launching it. And, because the FTC is both an antitrust enforcer but also a consumer protection agency, we've actually structured the honors program so that you would spend um, a, you know, a year and a half in one bureau, but then a year and a half in the other bureau, uh, which hopefully would give people more exposure. Um, but also, ultimately, we hope help, help kind of re-embed in the agency's DNA how these two parts of our mission are actually deeply integrated. Um, so over the last century, there were a whole bunch of cases where the FTC actually both alleged harm to competition, but also harm to consumer protection. And these were really seen um, part and parcel of, of a collected, integrated approach. And so we're hopeful that being able to do this type of rotation program can also have, help kind of reactivate that approach. All right. So if anyone has any questions, there are mics. Do you want to go first, Steph? Yeah, absolutely. So is this on? Maybe not. How about now? No. Nope. Hmm. You want to take mine? Sorry, I'm more worried about this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so mine is on. Oops, sorry. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Terracon, you mentioned the uh, Biden's executive um, order on competition, and I'm just curious what the FTC has done in terms of working across agencies, particularly in industries that are covered by other statutory exemptions? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and a lot of that ends up happening behind the scenes. So there are a whole bunch of instances in which the EO uh, instructed executive agencies to do certain reports. And you know, as part of that, we would do consultations. Uh, so the Commerce Department did a report on app stores. Uh, the USDA is doing a whole bunch of rulemaking related to agriculture markets. Um, so we've been very engaged with them. Uh, we actually also submitted a comment to USDA explaining why we thought you know, transparency and disclosure was not sufficient, especially in markets where you already have significant asymmetry of power and lack of choice. Uh, we told them to go beyond disclosures. Um, more generally, we've also been entering into MOUs, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, with various agencies to make sure that we can just do things like share non-public information. Um, so one area we've been active is with um, agencies overseeing kind of labor markets. So we entered into an uh, MOU with the Department of Labor, as well as with the NLRB, 
Um, and that's more generally part of our broader work to ensure that we're enforcing the laws to protect everybody, um, consumers, but also workers. And so that's also been another way that we've been able to kind of make sure that all of our agencies are working very closely together. Thank you. Do you want to try the mic? It's, uh, it's not working. <laughs> It might be. Yeah, yeah. That works. Um, Go for it. Yeah, thank you. I had a question for you um, on just the right way uh, to establish new theories of harm in sectors like technology or pharma, and uh, specifically just how you balance um, you know, the need for courts to start establishing new precedent against the patients required for the right cases to come, for the right facts to be there to actually bring a winning case. Yeah, it's a good question and certainly um, one that reasonable minds can disagree on. Um, I also don't think it's either or. So the FTC has a pretty broad portfolio and so we can kind of balance um, you know, cases where uh, we're waiting for the exact right set of facts to come before us to make sure that we're um, advancing the theory um, versus not. I mean, I'll say as a general matter, you know, we only bring cases where we think there is a law violation. Um, and one other dimension that we have to weigh is uh, degree of harm. So, you know, we have as enforcers limited resources. And one risk that I'm very aware of is if you exclusively, if the only criteria you're thinking about is which market can I find the absolute best set of facts to map on to the existing precedent even if we think the existing precedent might be somewhat calcified, you could end up you know, focusing on a drug that like a couple of thousand people use, right? As opposed to a drug that's affecting hundreds of thousands of people. And so that dimension of magnitude of harm is one that we think about as well. Um, I would say overall, you know, we believe the antitrust statutes are designed to be flexible and we have an obligation to be explaining to the courts how some of these traditional precedents are applied in these new contexts. Uh, we can do that through our cases. We can also do that through amicus briefs. Um, both us and the antitrust division have been quite active in that regard. Um, at the end of the day, you know, in order to be successful in terms of getting courts to accept um, some of these newer theories, we need to, um, uh, you know, we need to bring the right cases. We also need to be fully, um, fully making use of all the precedent that's on the books. And something that we try to do, something that we do in our new merger guidelines is actually canvas all of the governing case law that is still valid legal precedent and make sure that the agencies are geared up to, to make full use of that. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Uh, when you're reviewing mergers, how important is candor or like a willingness to cooperate with the agency to you? Or do you tend to think urgency is a red flag? I guess kind of what are you weighing when you're reviewing these mergers? And are there particular, when you say urgency, you mean if companies are trying to take shortcuts with the information they're sharing with us? If they seem to be, you know, trying to move things along quickly, get the deal done, get it pushed through, review, I guess. Yeah, I mean, all companies want their deal to go through as quickly as possible. And our investigations are premised on the uh, assumption that companies are being truthful and honest and you know, providing all the information that they're required to provide. Um, so I don't think we would see kind of you know, a company's interest in moving, uh, moving a deal along as quickly as possible as some type of red flag, since all companies want that certainty and want their deal to close as quickly as possible. Um, I will say, you know, there are various um, public complaints that uh, the FTC and DOJ have filed now where they've noticed that uh, the use of some of these disappearing um, chat apps, including Signal, is creating just evidentiary challenges for the agency. So they'll, you know, put a document uh, retention hold on a company and then find out that there have actually been, you know, exfoliation and destruction of evidence. So just from an evidentiary standpoint and investigatory standpoint, I would say that's one of the challenges we face. Thanks. Thank you. Chair thank you so much for taking the time to come speak with us at the law school. 
I guess following up on what you said about corporate power and taking classes other than antitrust, I'm curious as to what classes in law school you took besides antitrust that really inform your work now or you were really grateful to have taken and also how we can include more discussion of consumer protection or antitrust litigation in the public interest community as law students. So in addition to antitrust, um, some of the classes I took were uh, what was called business organizations or kind of corporate law, uh, trade law, um, since trade has become kind of a key site of companies trying to use trade agreements to bypass domestic policy making and kind of override what might be domestic limits on how they can use their power. Um, First Amendment law, um, which had kind of emerged as a key deregulatory tool where companies were claiming that various business regulations were violating the First Amendment. Um, that was extremely instructive. First Amendment law, I would say, was also very useful because um, it, it kind of, through doctrines like the chilling effect, it kind of encapsulates a recognition that power structurally can be a problem, even if it's not exercised. Uh, and so, you know, something like the chilling effect, where there's, uh, you know, or cases that say, and, government's prior restraint schemes where the government, say, said, uh, if you're a newspaper, you have to run your editorial by us, um, that that could be intrinsically chilling of speech in ways that was problematic, even if the government never exercised that power to shut down an editorial. And if you look at earlier instances of antitrust jurisprudence, they're kind of analogous recognitions that kind of concentrated power, monopoly power, itself can be structurally coercive or structurally problematic, even if it's not being exercised in ways that are immediately tangible. And so just at a kind of more bones of the doctrine level, there were also just really interesting re resonances there. Um, a class that I didn't get the chance to take but would have wanted to was bankruptcy law. Um, I think especially right now, we're seeing how companies are using bankruptcy in really uh, creative ways to sometimes sidestep their legal obligations uh, to be kind of, you know, making certain payouts to consumers or workers. Um, so that's another one that comes to mind. And then as public interest minded students at the law school, how can we include more of a consumer protection or antitrust oriented students like within that framework rather than um, kind of more traditional direct services or like environmental law type uh, oriented students? I mean, I imagine, you know, through doing programming that's helping spotlight how areas like antitrust and consumer protection, you know, connect to people's other areas of public interest um, as well would be one way, but um, I know there are various uh, student organizations that are also doing a lot of work to be kind of showcasing how some of these laws, as well as the other areas of law around corporate power, kind of have a direct public interest appeal too. Oh, sure. Hi, Chair Khan. Um, thank you again so much for coming to speak with us. Uh, you mentioned the new merger guidelines, which I know were a very welcome update to the 2010 guidelines and incorporated lots of great stuff about labor markets and updates to the HHI. I know one main concern is when the agency often updates these guidelines, there is a concern about how seriously courts will take them. And I was wondering how the agency navigates and, and thinks about updates to its policy statements and guidelines and when it wants to balance the level of consideration it will be given by a court versus being viewed as maybe like flip-flopping between its policy perspectives. Mm -hmm. So we kind of keep a few principles top of mind. Um, one is just to make sure we're going back to the text of the statutes. Um, the courts have made clear that they really back value textualism as a, as a method of statutory interpretation. And I would say in antitrust overall, um, both textualism and originalism have been somewhat underappreciated in terms of you know, getting jurisprudence that's not really tethered to those statutory methods. So uh, when we're kind of taking a fresh look, we, given the court's preference for those methods, um, make sure we incorporate those. Uh, we're also doing a full canvassing of all the legal precedent on the books. I think sometimes some people can take the approach that it's the role of enforcers or regulators to kind of second guess what past courts have done or to say, 
well, we're seeing these trends and the court's tilting this way. And so, yes, that precedent might be on the books, but we know that precedent has fallen out of fashion, so it's not relevant to us. As an enforcer, I don't think that's my job at all. I think I have to kind of take seriously the precedent on the books, uh, all of it, um, and kind of fully enforce the law in ways that's aligned with it. And so that's why in the merger guidelines, for example, we fully canvassed you know, every appellate and Supreme Court decision that interpreted Section 7 of the Clayton Act uh, and made sure that our guidelines were fully being honest to that precedent. Yeah. I read an interesting article by you in May on the risks of generative AI, in which you posited that the very problem associated with the Web 3.0 revolution, like invasive practices and data, uh, would, keep, would be further expanded by the rise of AI and also alongside turbocharging fraud. And you ended with that we need to make the right policy practices or the policy choices. But at the same time, right now, this whole AI industry is still very legally unmapped. We have a gray area here because we still don't know to what extent would this industry expand, how is it going to look like. So since then, has there been any progress made, any form of statutory uh, work in regards to how to regulate these industries better? And has there been any blowback to that particular uh, path? So there's certainly a lot of discussions happening in DC, including in Congress, about kind of what are the right additional statutory authorities needed. Um, and there are lots of different dimensions to those conversations, right? There's a dimension that's about election integrity. Uh, there's a dimension relating to safety and national security. Uh, for the FTC, we're really focused on competition and consumer protection. And one thing that we've wanting, been wanting to make clear is there absolutely is space for and it's Congress's prerogative to be having discussions about what new legislation might be needed. Um, but it would be a mistake for us as enforcers to just sit on our hands and not enforce the existing laws. And I think we've seen just from experience and history that sometimes when there are new technologies that come onto the market, some of the firms may have an interest in convincing enforcers and regulators that these tools are so new and so different um, that they require just an entirely different paradigm and the existing laws are not good fits for them. Congress might ultimately decide that, but in, in the interim, uh, we've taken the position that there's no AI exemption from the laws on the books. And so laws prohibiting collusion, laws prohibiting fraud, uh, laws prohibiting certain forms of discrimination, um, that all of those still apply. Um, we released a statement with a whole bunch of other agencies earlier this year, kind of mapping out how each agency's statutory authorities would apply in this instance. Um, and so it's something that we are tracking closely. I think overall, DC now recognizes that with Web 2.0, there was a belief that the government should just sit back and the market would be so fast moving that if you saw monopoly power, for example, it would self-correct that the markets were so dynamic. And I think there's been a recognition now that if anything, digital markets in particular can be quicker to tip, right? There are feedback loops that are network externalities. And so if anything, government needs to be more vigilant. And so I think uh, learning from that experience, we're wanting to make sure that we're not allowing bottlenecks to emerge that are kind of artificially created or maintained through monopoly power. Hi, Chair Khan. Thanks again for speaking with us today. Um, I guess coming out of the pandemic, there's been an increased spotlight on the healthcare and pharmaceutical industry. Um, and we've seen efforts to try to, to go at those guys, both in the private sphere, like Mark Cuban's cost plus drugs, uh, but also increased enforcement from, from the FTC. Um, I guess going forward, are there any like pharmaceutical industry practices or actors or norms that you guys are looking at? Yeah, great question. So healthcare is a big area of focus for us and drug pricing in particular. Uh, we have a whole bunch of work streams related to this. So one is um, you know just general scrutiny of pharma M and A. Uh, this summer, we brought our the FTC's first challenge to a pharmaceutical merger in over a decade. Uh, we sought to challenge um, Amgen's acquisition of Horizon. Uh, and in that lawsuit, we made clear that prior anti-competitive practices can be relevant to how we analyze a deal. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of work ongoing related to PBMs, uh, pharmacy benefit managers, which are these kind of middlemen in the pharmaceutical supply chain. 
Um, there, we're looking both at patient-facing practices. There, there's been a lot of concern that the rebates and kickbacks that you see between PBMs and drug manufacturers might incentivize PBMs to put, to, to put on the formulary um, drugs that are most lucrative for them rather than drugs that are most affordable for patients. Uh, we've also heard a lot of concerns about how vertical integration by PBMs may be resulting in steering and other practices that could be squeezing out independent pharmacies. Um, so those are practices that are top of mind for us. Uh, a couple of months ago, we also put out a policy statement laying out how the FTC would approach the Orange Book, uh, which is this um, repository that the FDA oversees where companies are able to list their patents. And if they list a patent, they get an automatic stay if there's a generic that's trying to enter the market. Um, we believe that there may have been abuse of the Orange Book, and there may be patents that are listed there illegitimately. And so we noted that illegit patents that we believe are illegitimately listed in the orange book would be an unfair method of competition. Um, so those are just some work streams on drug pricing. We also are looking at um, hospital consolidation and consolidation across the healthcare supply chain, and then also have a bunch of work uh, on the consumer privacy front in healthcare, given that another trend we saw during the pandemic was a shift to more uh, digital services for healthcare, and we worry that people's privacy is not always being adequately protected when they're using some of these health apps. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. This will have to be our last question. So, Chair Khan, you may get to her other events. Otherwise, oh. hopefully, everyone heard that. Okay. Hi, Chair Khan. Thanks again so much for coming. Uh, my question is uh, as we're kind of entering this new era of of antitrust, uh, how do you view the role of the government versus private class actions? It's a good question. And one interesting thing about the Sherman and Clayton Act, though not the FTC Act, is that there are private rights of action. Um, and one reason that there is a private right of action in the Sherman Act in particular was because Congress recognized that you needed some opportunity for outsiders. <laughs> You needed some opportunity for outsiders to also be able to enforce the antitrust laws because worst case scenario, if you had monopolists that use their political power to also capture the government, the government itself might not necessarily be the most reliable um, enforcer of the antitrust laws. And so you wanted to have the government in the game, but you also wanted to have kind of safety valves um, and, and private enforcement could be one of those. Um, historically, there's also been uh, kind of a symbiotic relationship between private and public antitrust actions. And so sometimes it's been private lawsuits that have kind of opened the door and you know, surfaced evidence that ultimately resulted in the federal government building a bigger case. And so I absolutely see that you know, symbiotic relationship. Um, more often, you probably see the government bringing a lawsuit and then follow on private cases. But you know, I think it's a all hands on deck moment, and so I think um, you know, private enforcers um, being involved is is really critical. Obviously, there are treble damages and other remedies that are available to private plaint uh, private plaintiffs. Uh, you know, one interesting um, set of theories about why you've seen courts uh, trim antitrust doctrine is that they have been afraid about treble damages. And so it's also an interesting question about when you want the pup government to be bringing a case versus um, private plaintiffs where courts might have that in their back of their mind. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak with everybody today. If we could just give a quick round of applause to Chair Khan. Thanks so much. Um, the recording from this event will be uh, distributed only to people who RSVP'd. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate your presence, and thank you again to Chair Khan and her team. Thanks so much.